please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the sixth edition of Latest Trends in Tourism, Hospitality and Event Management. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you today Eugene Quinn. We met, we met a few years ago. Um, he had an exciting business idea, had the courage to realize it, and is the founder of Space and Place in Vienna. I'm very happy that you're here today. Thank you for taking um, this invitation and speak to our students. The floor is yours. So thank you, Geraldine. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I've been to the module a few times, but it's, um, it's great to be back. The, the ride up the hill from Vienna, central Vienna, is very romantic. We're lucky to, uh, to, to be studying in such a beautiful um, space with such a spectacular view of our city. Uh, my name is Eugene Quinn. I was born in London. Uh, my name is Irish. My parents are Irish, so I was always somehow a migrant. And uh, 12 years ago, I met an Austrian woman in Berlin, and we had a three years long distance relationship between um, London and Vienna. Uh, very romantic, uh, very expensive, very complicated, trying to keep our love going between London and Vienna. Uh, in fact, we met up all over Europe, and after three years, we said, come on, this is ridiculous, we've got to choose a city to live in together. And uh, we had a nuanced debate who would give up their their life, you know, their, their job, their flat, their friends, their language, and I, I lost this debate uh, and moved to Vienna. And I now like living here much more than my Austrian wife does. <laughs> and, uh, I think to be a, a migrant, um, how many of you are from Austria? Okay, six or seven, okay. Well, the rest of us are migrants and 16% um, of people around the world dream of uh, moving to live in another country, but only 3% ever do it. So we're part of a, a tiny minority of people with the, uh, the courage and the curiosity and the craziness to, uh, to walk away from our original country, at least for some time. Um, I think to be a migrant gives you lots of opportunities because um, you can see what you miss from home and think, well, how could I play with that and, and recreate it? You know, migrants often bring a new kind of uh, energy to a city, to you know, knowing about food or music from home, language, dance, uh, you know, different, a different approach to life. And um, I am not a Viennese. I've been here for nine years, and I remain somehow an outsider, uh, still able to judge things that I find in Vienna strange as strange. Whereas, uh, you know, to some extent, once you, if you grow up in a place, you don't know how odd things are. Every country has odd things. It's not that the end is any more odd. It's simply that the locals are used to it, and uh, those of us who, who come from somewhere else can, can see it, and maybe celebrate it as well. So I was unemployed when I first arrived in Vienna. I used to be a BBC uh, radio journalist in London, and uh, I looked around for what I couldn't find. And I thought about the relationship between uh, tourism and humor, tourism and comedy. In London, this is a very common uh, format to, to play with the city's identity and to make fun of it a little bit. And uh, Vienna can be a fairly serious place. A lot of the great tourism stories from Vienna, uh, they tend to end slightly tragically. Um, if you think about Mozart dying age 35, um, CC, um, Freud having to leave the, uh, the city as a Jew, um, often, you know, there, there is a kind of sad ending, uh, but I wanted to uh, play with the city and also to remix it, which is the name of my speech today. Um, half, of, half of my friends in London have not been to visit me yet in Vienna. They said if, if, I, if, we, if I was in Barcelona or in Berlin, they would come and visit, but they're not really sure why they should come to Vienna, because Vienna's international profile um, at least outside of the German-speaking world, is the tourism profile of the city. There's not really very much difference how people understand Vienna. You know, um, some bigger cities around the world, people have a more complex understanding of the city and what it means. It's in the news regularly. You know, if you think about uh, Paris or New York City, you know, bombs go off there, and so people have a, another take on on the city. Whereas Vienna remains for many people this Sisi and Schnitzel city, and. Um, 
good, good in many ways. You know, we don't necessarily want lots of news coming to Vienna um, because it's usually bad news. But nevertheless, um, it's problematic, in my opinion, if, if people just understand the city to be a kind of waltzing chocolate cake, you know, a dusty museum, which is always looking backwards to its golden age. Vienna has the highest quality of life in the world in 2017, and that is a remarkable achievement and a new story, which the city, for complicated reasons, doesn't particularly communicate. Um, I discovered that there are uh, eight travel journalists in Vienna for every news journalist. That means that if you want to tell some new stories about your city, even if they're not, they're not really tourism stories, if you can somehow create a tourism angle for them, then you can get lots more coverage in the international press. I am a journalist, I'm uh, trained as a storyteller, and we wanted to tell some new stories about Vienna. For example, walking around the city. Uh, mostly if you see a big group of people walking together through Vienna, you assume that they are not from Vienna. Our uh, the thing that I'm most proud of is that we uh, invite the Viennese to walk around Vienna. And in general, if you visit Vienna for a weekend, it's not that easy to meet the Viennese. Um, this is not a city where there's an obvious forum where you can go and get to know the Viennese. 38% um, of people in Vienna leave the city every weekend. They, are, they become tourists in the countryside nearby. World-class tourists, and world-class uh, countryside, you know, the lakes, the forests, the vineyards, the mountains. Uh, I understand why they leave, but it's a shame because many of the streets in Vienna are left to tourists at the weekend. Without the tourists, there wouldn't be very many people around. The Viennese tend to relax at the weekend, not to do a great deal. Um, but that, this is an opportunity, uh, if you come on one of our walks, um, which is the first thing um, I created for Space and Place, our non-profit group, was walks which would be equally interesting to the Viennese as to visitors. And therefore, if you come as an outsider on our walks, you're going to meet the Viennese on our walks. And that's um, because our walks are somehow um, a new way of looking at Vienna, which are equally interesting to, to uh, locals as to visitors. And therefore, uh, people end up speaking to each other and who knows what else later on while they are in Vienna. I think if you go to Ireland for um, a weekend, you're wandering to a pub in Ireland, it's not too difficult to get to speak to the Irish. If you go to uh, Italy, wander into a cafe or make the passeggiata in Italy, uh, walking the streets before dinner, you're going to meet lots of Italians. They're not so shy. If you go to uh, all over Latin America, people will talk to you for no reason. There's a kind of bourgeois angst in Vienna. The people don't spontaneously wander up to strangers and go, hey, tell me your story, what's your name, where are you from? The people here are slightly more shy, a bit more intellectual, and in general they don't open up to strangers in quite the same way. But we wanted to, to play with that um, a little bit. So, um, yeah, we created this group, Space and Place, and we, we're not exactly a tourist group, but um, we happen to look like a tourist group, and therefore we work with many groups um, around the city, different universities, different uh, media organisations, uh, opening up interesting partnerships. So we work transdisciplinary. A lot of people in Vienna, if they imagine um, tourists here, they try to avoid them. My wife um, doesn't really go to the first district because she says it's Disneyland. You know, a place which is artificial, overpriced, and there's nothing really for local people. It's not true at all, but it is quite a common idea in Vienna that the first district has, has been lost to tourism. And uh, there are many, many reasons why um, you should and could speak to visitors to our city, to travellers, to, to tourists. Um, number one, we are all tourists. Anybody with a passport has travelled, and therefore, you know, somehow we view tourists as a or many people in Vienna choose to avoid tourists, but tourists are us, you know? Vienna is the number two conference city in the world. For many of the people who look like tourists, you know, they might be holding their map upside down, but in fact they are um, at the top of their game, you know, they're academics, they're researchers, they're journalists, they're doctors, and they're in Vienna for three or four days, but they look like tourists because they're a bit confused how the U-Bahn works, or you know, they're not sure which restaurant to go to, or they're wandering around taking selfies. Um, so we wanted to um, perhaps um, respect tourists a bit more because if I, you know, if I go to, if the Viennese go to Moscow for the weekend or to Milan, they want to 
be treated with respect and get to know some locals. We live in an age of experiential travel, where people don't just want to necessarily, you know, post on Instagram. They actually would like to uh, taste the local food, dance with the locals, get to know them. And that's really a challenge, I think, in Vienna. Um, I'm being critical today. I absolutely love Vienna, but just for the reason of um, uh, being slightly polemical, I'm, I'm presenting some of the challenges for visitors to Vienna and some of the solutions which we have tried to find. Um, and there's lots of time for questions at the end, so please um, think about how you, uh, your own responses. Um, the, uh, so half of my London friends have not been to visit me. The other half, who did come to visit me, absolutely loved Vienna. Right? So there's a big difference between how they imagine the city is going to be and how it really is. And how do we kind of close that gap between the fantasy of Vienna, this, this beautiful 19th century city, and the city as it is now? That's the challenge um, which we were engaged with. Because you know, if you, if you visit um, London or New York, you might well be going for a 2017 experience. But most of the visitors to Vienna imagine that they're coming for a 19th century experience. And they find it. They really love it. But it's not the lived reality of the locals, and that's a shame that, that somehow tourism represents something slightly retro and kitsch for many people in Vienna. Um, of course, the tourists do also go to Urbanplatz and the Donau Canal street art and to Museumsquartier, but the most visible ones are large groups on buses or big walking groups wandering through the Hofburg or Schönbrunn, which is another kind of, uh, you know, adventure and experience um, in Vienna. So, I have some um, slides for you. These are the 20 most searched words uh, online in English, it's important to say not in German, uh, connected to Vienna. So people put in Vienna on Google, and then these are the words that, that Google suggests to you. It's, um, you know, there's lots of beautiful things on there. Uh, there's lots of things that I quite like, but it's not, there's nothing new, nothing contemporary. And this is problematic, that, uh, you know, there's no Conchita, um, there's no, you know, the quality of life, the ideas which, which we might know. And um, there's a disconnection, ultimately, between uh, this list and who we are. You know, if you, if you Google Copenhagen and then something, it won't just be all of the... Uh, Tourist cliches. So somehow Vienna's, uh, you know, Vienna after 1914 or 1950, there isn't, there isn't, isn't really reflected, even though it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, so we wanted um, again to, to try to get some newer words into this list. We work at the intersection of politics and fun. Journalists are much more political than ordinary people. And if you are interested in selling your story to the media, and um, you should be, um, see if you can consider not just a tourism angle for a non-tourist story, see if you can find ways in which the locals could join you for your events. Most of all, see if you can think about a political angle, because tourism is deeply political. We see that with the changes every year in where people go to. You know, uh, I have a friend, by the way, um, Martina, and um, she reads the newspapers, and wherever a bomb has gone off this week, she books a holiday to go there. Because she, you get treated like a Kaiserie. If you rock up in a town where a bomb went off last week, it's pretty safe, usually. And, uh, you know, there's lots of special offers, <laughs> last minute offers, lots of cancellations. There's no queues. So it's a kind of reverse strategy. You know, instead of kind of going to the most busy places, she goes to places, you know, interesting places in which um, some people are scared to go. So politics and fun is a space that people don't imagine exists quite often. They, they, they cannot imagine that politics could be fun. But in an age of rising intolerance, uh, all, all around uh, Europe and, and North America, where borders are starting to be closed, um, we, we, we consider that we should uh, try to fill up this space, try to engage uh, younger people into being political, but in a joyous way. Uh, you know, with, with dance, with food, with uh, multi you know, complexity. Um, this is the list of the top 12 cities in Europe. Vienna often feels a little bit like a dwarf, like a, a, a little village. Um, but it's quite an achievement for, for you know, a population so large, for the city still to have a kind of old school coziness and charm. Um, you can see that some of the cities um, further up the list are rather less famous, less visited. Uh, Vienna still has a, um, a 
kind of the patterns of life in some ways have not changed as much as they have in some of the other cities. Um, if you measure water usage, which is an interesting alternative measure, there are already two million people um, in Vienna. Um, this is the quality of life ranking, um, which ultimately is, is slightly different to tourism, but not entirely, because it is ultimately about the idea of people uh, traveling for so many different reasons these days. And uh, this list is, is compiled every year for um, Mercer, which is um, a business consultancy about where to live. And Vienna has been top of the list, as you can see. Uh, also in, in 2017, the, the new one will be published in March. It's a, it's a remarkable achievement. And part of the reason uh, that Vienna uh, scores so highly in quality of life is education. Um, it's, this is a list compiled for expats about where they might not want to go. So what's less important at the, uh, the top of the list is not so important as being at the bottom of the list. Because if you have to send business people to Mogadishu, to, uh, you know, to uh, Kabul, to Damascus, then you have to pay them a lot more. You don't have to pay them anything more to come to Vienna. It's not such a challenging city to, to live in. Um, many of these cities are not places that anybody particularly wants to visit. They might seem a little bit uh, boring. I mean, uh, with respect, Dusseldorf is number six. And it's not nobody's uh, idea of a favorite city, I think, uh, outside, of, outside of Dusseldorf, um, Frankfurt. Uh, you know, so they're, they're kind of second category cities. They're not, not the most famous cities in the world. I moved from London. Um, which is number 44 on this list, to Vienna, which is number one. So in that sense, it wasn't such a challenge to think about where to go um, and live. Here's the tourism uh, rankings um, for 2015, 2016. The numbers above the, the boxes are the increase, decrease uh, on, on uh, 2015. And uh, you can see Vienna is, um, is rising. It has been rising for, for many years. This is a successful city. Um, the average age of visitors to Vienna is 44 years old and the average age of visitors to Amsterdam is 26 years old. Um, this is not a party city. Um, uh, people don't spontaneously dance so much here, uh, except at balls. Um, but it's, uh, you know, Vienna has other kinds of charms. Um, it's not necessarily a problem. In fact, it is a problem for many cities getting too many young people in, whose lifestyle is rather different to the locals also. Um, so I created a tour. Uh, Vienna Ugly of the worst architecture in Vienna. <laughs> it makes no sense to tour the worst architecture, but uh, we uh, came up with, that, with the idea that we could play a little bit with how Vienna is understood. Vienna is very beautiful, but if you walk past all the beautiful buildings and just look at the little loser buildings beside them that nobody ever looks at, we wanted to somehow play a little bit with what, what people might want to look at. And um, there is a stylish melancholy in Vienna. Uh, if you listen to a lot of the uh, music from the city, uh, the Wiener Lieder, uh, the traditional you know, kind of songs of the city, it's about death and failure and decay. Um, a lot of the writers are quite tragic. Um, if you ever see any films by Ulrich Seidel, um, it's not much fun to watch. It's a kind of freak show of people you really want to avoid in life. Um, Thomas Bernhardt was famously a complainer, uh, quite drunk as well. Um, there's something, uh, the Viennese often seem more comfortable with a certain kind of failure and therefore we wanted to make a tour which only looks at the worst architecture and we ask the visitors on the walk to vote for each of the buildings if it is ugly or not. You know, so it's a democratic, interactive tour. They tell us, they make a judgement, is this building ugly or not? There's no such thing as an ugly building or a beautiful building, it's just our judgment of it. When the Eiffel Tower was built in Paris, the locals hated it. They said it didn't fit in the city, you know, that it, uh, it was a waste of, of uh, metal, that it would fall down, you know. People take about 30 years to begin to love buildings. Their first reaction is that there's too much change going on, why can't we go back to how things used to be? Um, there are 300 new towers being built in London above um, 40 stories tall. So when I go back there now, I am a tourist, you know, I don't recognize my own city. It has changed so relentlessly, so fast, that it can be slightly terrifying to, to be there. So uh, in that sense, um, I'm not a Londoner anymore. I'm a visitor in London, but I'm also not quite a Viennese. I'm somewhere in between, and uh, I kind of like that distance in a way. Um, so yeah, we created Vienna Ugly in the week of the Eurovision Song Contest, which the Eurovision Song Contest um, 
came to Vienna two years ago, and we proposed to Vienna Tourism. Um, you have 1,600 journalists coming to Vienna, and a different kind of uh, journalist than usually comes. You know, young bloggers, lots of uh, gay people, lots of journalists who are interested in style and music and art uh, coming to Vienna. That's an opportunity, you know. Are you going to show them Schönbrunn, you know, and, and ZC, or in fact, are you going to show them something, you know, which is about Vienna now? The Eurovision Song Contest, you all know it? Yeah? It's about bad singing, bad dancing, bad costumes, bad national representation. And we thought, okay, let's respond with some bad taste of our own. Um, everybody knows Vienna is beautiful. Uh, I don't think I would make an ugly tour of an ugly city. You know, genuinely ugly city. There'll never be a Houston ugly tour because it would take too long and it wouldn't be very funny. But Vienna's beautiful and therefore, you know, we want to show the contrast between the beautiful buildings and the ugly ones and think, well, how did the ugly ones ever get built? What's the story um, behind them? So, Vienna Ugly, uh, from the beginning, had interest from journalists. We were in The Guardian on the day that the tour began. And, uh, you know, we recognised that Eurovision was a big, big opportunity for Vienna to say something new. And uh, I hope that we were able to seize it. Um, that was a uh, film crew from uh, ORF, uh, Kultur Montag. So, our walk was also judged to be culture, which is, um, I'm not completely sure if it is culture, but lots of property companies have booked the tour privately because they really don't want their buildings to be part of the tour. You know, so they come and they write down everything that we say. Um, so in that sense, you know, we, we were in the architecture pages, but also in the uh, style pages, in the culture pages of the newspapers and on TV, um, because we wanted to, to play a little bit with how Vienna is understood. It's a bit ridiculous for an Englishman to show people from Vienna, around Vienna, but um, somehow um, they enjoy this cruelty. Um, remember that the Baron von Sacco Masso, who created masochism, he was an Austrian. Um, yeah, so the tour um, was originally myself and uh, Nina Hochreiner, who, is, uh, who presents the morning show on FM4. I hope you all listen to FM4. It is a world-class radio station from Vienna, playing great music, uh, lots of humour, lots of science, lots of ideas, uh, and very important for the Vienna scene. So it was important for me that the tour felt like it belonged, in a way, to Vienna. So I invited a local along to do it, and that is also an interesting opportunity. You know, if you are creating an event that you want you know, if you want to present it in the local language, if you want to make it feel like it belongs, maybe invite along a local journalist to do it with you. And therefore, of course, we got lots of coverage on FM Fear. But uh, Nina got it immediately. And she doesn't like Vienna at all. I didn't know that, but uh, she's from Föklapurk. Föklapurk, uh, sort of towards the middle of the country. And so it was an opportunity for her to criticize um, Vienna in a humorous way. Um, we uh, call ourselves rebellious optimists, so we have a kind of uh, campaign uh, in the media. Uh, these are two words that don't really fit together, but we wanted to uh, look positively on Vienna, even if many of the locals you know, um, are very critical of Vienna, which is um, problematic. You know. uh, tourists are very excited to be in Vienna, and often the locals are not quite so excited to be here. So that is another reason to visit tourism neighbourhoods, that the tourists are much more optimistic. You know, wandering around, seeing everything beautiful, and uh, that's another, I think, opportunity for the Viennese to plug into that energy and uh, fun that, that uh, visitors bring. So, yeah, we, we call ourselves rebellious optimists because we want to uh, find what is, what is good in Vienna instead of all of the problems. Vienna, of course, is, uh, Austria has recently elected a, a government which is not so keen on, on migration and uh, outsiders, so this is, I think, probably not going to be very good for tourism in Austria. Let's see, but um, you know, complicated days um, ahead, I think. Um, we created something called the Vienna Coffee House Conversations. This is a monthly celebration of the coffee house tradition. I absolutely adore coffee houses in Vienna, and uh, many people kind of neglect them. They go there when they've got visitors, but they don't go so often. This is the Landmann Saal of Café Landmann. Uh, Sigmund Freud used to sit just beyond the door on the right every morning. So it really is a, a beautiful um, historic cafe. And uh, we wanted to connect the United Nations in Vienna with the Viennese. So the UN are not exactly tourists, but they do find it difficult to meet the locals. And the locals find it quite difficult to meet the United Nations. And it's a beautiful thing to have a UN office in Vienna. But ultimately, the project um, is still running uh, in English. And um, we sit strangers together for two hours of social dining to go a bit deeper into 
a kind of exchange of ideas. And because they say the Viennese are not very good at small talk, but really quite good at big talk, we have a question menu so that the people can get over that clumsiness. Um, in, in general, if you want to talk to people here about you know, celebrity diets or last night's TV or you know, football, it doesn't go very well. But if you want to talk psychology, philosophy, it go, goes much better. So we have this menu of questions uh, instead of a menu of food where people sit together and ask each other these questions. Some of, them, some of the questions are completely scandalous. You would never ask anybody them, but because they're written down, you end up speaking them. So um, this menu of questions has been uh, a very popular way to open up conversations. It's a kind of icebreaker, let's say. Um, one of the questions is, um, what have you learned from traveling that you brought back to your lifestyle at home? Um, how has your family background helped you or limited you? you know, what, how, how have your family been a problem for you? Um, how important is money to you? Big questions, and it's really interesting. We've had people from 66 different nations come and get to know the Viennese. And the Viennese come because they want some fresh air, they want to practice their English, they want to uh, maybe have a relationship with somebody from around the world, um, but also to represent the city in the end, you know. And um, many of them are surprised how uh, open they are in the kind of mutual trust by using the question menu. So I, I recommend if you would like to, to come along, it's a good way to meet some locals if you. I struggle with that, or if you're Austrian to come and meet people from, you know, it's, it's a question of having dinner with somebody from uh, from China, from Congo, from Saudi. Probably not a problem in the Modul University, but a problem in Vienna generally to uh, to have that kind of intimate time with uh, strangers. Um, yeah, 66 different nations so far. If you don't see your country on there, please come along. We'll add you to the map. Um, we see migration as a big opportunity. There was a wave of uh, refugees who came into uh, Vienna, uh, Austria, in 2015. And uh, this has galvanized the far right uh, parties. But um, there is a hotel, the Magdas Hotel in Vienna, uh, in which two thirds of the staff are refugees, have a refugee uh, background. And so that's a hotel which is non profit and celebrates refugee experience, instead of um, somehow hiding it away. You know, it's, um, it's a way to make social change just by having a glass of wine there. Of course, it's open to the locals. In general, people in Vienna don't wander into the big hotels along the ring for a kind of uh, glamorous night out. But in London, they do. The Londoners dress up and go for an exotic night out with interesting food and, and the people and a kind of James Bond atmosphere. Whereas, sadly, uh, outside of ball time, uh, the Viennese don't particularly go to the uh, local big, grand hotels. We, we do social dining in the Magdas Hotel, that's the connection between space and place. Um, I'm also a DJ and we play the music of all the different migrant communities in Vienna on some of the poorest squares to get the locals to dance with um, each other, uh, to hear music out of uh, Bosnia or Turkey, and the teenagers show each other how to dance to their steps, you know, from Chechnya, from uh, all over the world, from Nigeria, from uh, Pakistan, and I play all that music, and then and then the kids show each other how to dance their steps because they're used to hearing that kind of music, maybe in a um, at a house party or a wedding, but they're not used to hearing it uh, in the context of lots of people visiting and, and getting to know each other. Um, that's our website, uh, Space and Place, and um, we have new events all the time. This is Vienna in the 1980s. I think it's very important to to remember that Vienna was a very very different city when the Iron Curtain was um, about uh, 25 kilometers, 30 kilometers away. Um, there was much less dialogue with the east and uh, the south of Europe, and a, the city had this kind of brown color because the buildings hadn't been cleaned yet. If you go to Brno or some of the, um, some of the uh, cities of Central Europe on the other side of the Iron Curtain, they still have this brownness because of the original coal-fired uh, power station. So Vienna was a much stranger, a darker place in the 80s before the wave of migration came in that brought all this new music and dance and energy and ideas. Um, we propose to Wiener Linie. Um, there are 26 first languages spoken on Wiener Linie by the drivers on the buses, the trams and the U-Bahn in Vienna. And most people don't know that. And uh, because Vienna seems to be a place, the migrants in Vienna are less exotic, let's say, than they are in Paris or London. You cannot tell so much that people come from somewhere else because they come from Hungary, from Germany, from Serbia, from, from Bosnia, uh, Czech Republic, and so it looks like